They didn't mean it. Did they, did they see you? Yeah. Oh, good. Good. I have a nice, long, tall extension ladder that's bent at the top. So you just have to know which way it's bent so that you kind of lean the other way when you go up and you kind of balance, you know, if it's, it's, if as long as you lean opposite of the way it's leaning, you're good. It was on the side of the road. They were people, somebody was throwing it out, and I just I couldn't pass it up. We do, we do. We, we talked about that recently, the Jacob's Ladder, that song. Okay, well, welcome to our Thursday morning Bible study, and uh, we welcome those of you that are here in the auditorium, as well as those that might be visiting with us on live stream. We are studying the book of Hebrews, the highlights of Hebrews, I called it, and we're into the fourth chapter today, and we're going to read that in just a moment. But let me go ahead and pray, and we will get into it. Father in heaven, thank you for a new day. It's the day that you've made, and we want to rejoice and be glad in it. We want to pray for your presence to fill our hearts, your peace to fill our souls, and your word to fill our minds. Father, we pray then that our hands will do your bidding, that we will be faithful to be your servants here on this earth. And we thank you, Father, for the work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and for the redemption that we have in him and the joy we have in studying your word together. And we pray your blessing upon uh, the village and upon our individual families and our friends, many of whom are uh, facing challenges. We pray that you would uh, be at work in the lives of those who, who we love. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Before I forget, which I'm bound to do if I don't tell you now, next week we are starting a uh, Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock Bible study. We'll call it a Bible study, and it's for men only. I know I'm going to catch some flack about this, but uh, it was requested that we have a, a men's group, and so I'm going to provide that opportunity for any men that would like to gather in the card room at nine o'clock on Tuesday mornings. What exactly we do has not yet been determined, but we will have fun. We will have some food. We'll have coffee and some muffins or something. And uh, if, if you know of folks that might be interested in that, uh, pass the word. Next Tuesday is our first one, I think. So, Hebrews chapter 4, I made a copy of this for you so that you could see the connection of chapter 4 to chapter 3. It's an interesting thing that a lot of times the chapter divisions are really helpful and clear and that there is a, a real break between one chapter and the next chapter. Sometimes, however, the chapter divisions seem to be somewhat arbitrary. And really, uh, the flow of thought continues so clearly that you, you, really, don't, you really wonder why there was a, a new chapter <laughs> numbered at this point. And so, if I'm making my, myself clear, what I'm trying to say is that chapter 3 just kind of flows right into chapter 4, and you really don't understand one without the other. And that's why I wanted, to see, wanted you to have chapter 3 as a reference point, and we'll be looking back into that from time to time this morning. 
But notice chapter 4 begins, therefore, which always connects what's coming with what came before. Therefore is kind of a bridge word. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. There, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fail by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let's stop right there. Now, if you had just heard this read for the first time, and you are asked a question, and you were told that you would, if you could get the answer right, it would be worth a million dollars, all right? So I'm offering, I'm not offering, but I'm theoretically offering you a million dollars if you can tell me the one word focus of chapter 4. What word surfaced more times than any other word in that chapter? Look at you, you just won. Speak to Bob Green after the, the Bible study today and collect your winnings, and he will see that you, you, you get it. Okay, so as we read through that, you hear the word rest, rest, rest. And uh, if, if I had entitled my talk today, I would have made reference. Do you remember Paul Harvey? Okay. And his, his signature line was what? Now you know the rest of the story. Okay. Catch this. This is really big because our Bible study today is, and now you know the story of the rest. Not the rest of the story, but the story of the rest. You're just chilled. You're thrilled, right? Anyway. So this is the story of the rest, with all apologies to Paul Harvey. Now rest. What do you think of when you hear the word rest? It's a fascinating subject, isn't it? We all know the value of getting adequate rest and the risk of living without adequate rest. We've all paid the price for overdoing it at times, and we've all also become addicted at times to inactivity, which is equally harmful. Someone, you, you remember the name Bud Wilkinson? Football coach Bud Wilkinson, University of Oklahoma, I believe. He was once asked to describe the game of football. And he answered, football is a game where 40 people are desperately in need of rest and 40,000 spectators are def desperately in need of exercise. Rest on the one hand, exercise on the other hand, rest can be an exclusive but interesting commodity. Now, as Hebrews 4 addresses the subject of rest, we need to say, well, what, what's he talking about? What, what is the rest that, that is, are, is supposedly being entered into 
Is it the promised land of Canaan? Is it a, only an historical reference to the Old Testament where the children of Israel were going to enter into the promised land and that was to be their rest, this land flowing with milk and honey? Mm -hmm. Is the rest of God the life of peace uh, that David talks about in the 23rd Psalm when he talks about he makes me lie down in green pastures and this idea of still waters and you know just peacefulness, tranquility? Or is this rest maybe heaven? Our heavenly home, our heavenly rest. What is the rest? We're talking about entering into a rest, but what, what's the rest? I would suggest that the ultimate focus of the rest is indeed our heavenly life in the presence of God. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. The idea of resting from your labors, the peace that you have. That is certainly the greatest ultimate rest to experience, but there is also an experience of rest and peace on this side of heaven. The rest, we might say, of God's grace, the peace of God that we receive through faith, confidence in God's presence and promises, freedom from guilt, worry and fear, what Paul calls the peace that passes understanding. Jesus said, come to me and I will give you what? I will give you rest. Now that may be what David is describing in the 23rd Psalm when he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Philip Keller, who wrote the book A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm says, it's a fascinating thing for sheep to be able to lie down he says, because of their very makeup, it's impossible for sheep to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. They must be free of all fear. They must be free from friction with others of their kind. They must be free of pests. And they must be free from hunger. He says, sheep won't lie down unless they are free from fear, friction, pest, and hunger. And then he goes on to describe how in the gospel, God delivers us from our fear of these things, from the friction, we can have peace, we can have the bread of life as, as whatever. So this idea of lying down in green pastures is a beautiful description of how Christ through the gospel gives us rest. So rest is a fascinating subject. Now let's look at our text and just kind of, kind of see what it is we're dealing with. And I do want to begin with some context, and that is to kind of peek back into chapter 3. I know you, you, you have very good memories, but we've been a week between lessons here. Let me, let's remind ourselves what we, what we looked at last week, the record of the Old Testament history. The facts indicate that many in Moses' generation failed to enter the Promised Land. You know Moses' story. You know how Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea but there was a problem, and the problem was 40 years in resolving that problem before they come into the promised land, and the generation that came through the Red Sea did not go through the Jordan. Notice in chapter 3, verse 16, For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Here's a description of the, the generation that Moses led. They, verse 16, they heard yet rebelled. Verse 17, they sinned 
and died in the wilderness. Verse 18, they were marked by disobedience. And verse 19, they ultimately failed to enter due to an absence of faith. That's a description of that generation. They got to the Jordan, but they did not enter. They did not enter into the promised land. And what we learn about that particular generation is that their physical failure was a symbol of spiritual failure. Their physical failure to enter was a result of their spiritual failure. Their rebellious actions reflected rebellious hearts. Verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in the, as in the rebellion. And verse 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Their physical death illustrated a spiritual death. And their spiritual failure was the result of disobedience and unbelief. The last word of verse 19, unbelief. So here we have again, just kind of the context, that there was this generation in the Old Testament that experienced remarkable provision and deliverance from Egypt, the Red Sea, all of that God provided in the wilderness, and yet their hearts hardened and they did not enter that rest. So chapter 4 transitions into an exhortation to the current consideration. The author is connecting Old Testament history to the present day in the first century. He's saying we've got to learn something from the Old Testament that can be applied today. And what are those lessons? He declares first that a promise remains. God's invitation stands. Notice verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands. There is a door. There is an invitation into the rest of God. He announces that good news has come. Notice verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them. This is great news for him to be able to invite people to enter into the rest of God, into peace of God now and to the presence of God in heaven forever. This reminds me of the angels who, who spoke to the shepherds and said, I have good news of great joy that will be for all the people, for today in the city of David a Savior has been born. That's what we declare at Christmas. But here we have the writer saying, Good news came to us just as to them. What's the good news? He promises that according to verse 3, those who believe enter the rest. For we who have believed enter that rest. The promise stands. We have good news to share. The good news is that through belief we can enter into the rest of God. He adds in verse 1 a warning that we must take this matter seriously. Second half of verse 1, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Don't presume upon the grace of God. Just because the invitation exists, just because there is a way, just because there is a door, doesn't mean that you will automatically experience it or that you will automatically enter it. He reminds us in verse 2, we must express true faith to enter God's rest. For good news, verse 2, came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. They, th there was not faith present, and they failed to enter because of a lack of faith. We will only enter if there is a presence of faith. So he's appealing to this first century group who is considering 
leaving the faith or maybe they're considering their options at this point. He says the promise continues, the opportunity exists, attention is demanded, action is required, and indifference to all of this must be avoided. And then he moves on to talk more about the blessing of God's rest. In chapter 4 at verse 9, he tells us that God's people enjoy a Sabbath rest both now and eternally. Notice verse 9, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Oh, that, that just sounds so sweet, Remain, a Sabbath rest. God established the Sabbath day for our benefit, not to make us miserable, <laughs> but to give us rest. He kind of knew that if, if we weren't given a day of rest, we would turn every day into a day of self-dependence and, and, and activity, and we have almost in our culture turned his day of rest into a day where we are busier than ever. And uh, the author here is saying there remains a Sabbath rest. The principle of the Old Testament Sabbath is so much more beautiful now that God has a rest for us to enter in this life where we can have peace with God and a glorious rest in the next life when we have His presence. And then in verse 10, God's rest is the joy of grace whereby we rest from the burden of the law. For whoever, verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. God worked and then rested. And God wants us to rest in his grace and not feel that we have to achieve, accomplish our salvation or bring our good works to him in order to be pleasing to him. In verse 11, he teaches us that entering that rest demands focus and effort in order to avoid disobedience. Verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. There is a striving, despite it's all of grace, but there is a striving, there is a working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We must be focused. We must be faithful as God gives us grace to be, but we must apply ourselves. We must meditate. We must take initiative. We must exercise our spiritual disciplines. There is that balance. It's all of grace, but we don't just sit back and absorb it all. We receive it and then we act it out so that we might be mature in faith. He tells us that God's word is going to speak powerfully to our hearts in verse 12. This is a familiar verse. You've heard it many times before. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God works upon our hearts to give us insight into truth, to show us our sin, to lead us in righteousness. And to the degree that we make the Word of God our meditation, Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 119, then we will be people who are led by God's truth to enjoy His rest, but to pursue His grace and glory. And then verse 13, no one escapes the scrutiny of God's judgment. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So there's no kind of slipping in. There's, there's nobody that kind of can, can do it on their own. We're all uh, accountable before God. We are all exposed to God. God sees it all. We can't fool him. We must take this all seriously. And, and the writer of, of Hebrews wants his audience to, to take, take this very seriously. He appeals to uh, sinners of his day. And back in chapter 3 now, if we bounce back to chapter 3, remember what he says, don't delay. Uh, verse 7, today, if you hear his voice, 
He mentions today three times in, in this text. Don't harden your heart, verse 8. Do not harden your hearts. Know that God is, was, and will be just. Don't presume upon His mercy. Guard your hearts. Encourage each other, verse 13. Exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Realize how deceitful sin is, that none of you, verse 13, be hardened by the deceitfulness of sins. And remember, perseverance to the end is mandatory, not optional, verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. It's, it's as if he says the only evidence that your faith is real is that your faith is present at the end. Now that's not all that God says about assurance of salvation, but it is a, a challenge to us to ask ourselves, are we, are we uh, still faithful? Are we still uh, active and, and convinced and looking to Jesus? I'm reminded of that parable. You remember Jesus told the parable of the sower? He went out and sowed seeds, and it landed on four types of soil. There was one soil that just was no good, and there was one soil that was fruitful and plentiful, but in the middle were these two soils. The one was called rocky, and the other was called thorny. And you remember what was, what was said about them? Both the rocky and the thorny kind of showed immediate signs, initial signs of, of interest and fruitfulness. Uh, he, the rocky ground hears, immediately receives with joy. But he has no root. He endures for a little while, then tribulation or persecution arise, and immediately he falls away. The thorny soil, he hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Here are two different types of soil that give evidence initially of interest, but ultimately they don't. They are unfruitful. What does, what's that a reminder of what? It's a reminder that the way we start does not necessarily guarantee the way we will end. And we need to be careful. We may have had a glorious start with Christ and the gospel at some point, but let's be careful that we maintain our devotion over time so that we end with fruitful lives. It appears obvious that the writer of Hebrews is using the illustration of the Old Testament to exhort the people of the first century, and I would say of the 21st century, to persevere, not drift away. The generation led by Moses witnessed the miracles of God's deliverance, but they became distracted, they became rebellious, their hearts were hardened, they failed to enter the promised land. But the writer wants the people to know that there remains a Sabbath rest, 4-9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, who through death enter into the enjoyment of God's heavenly blessing. Those believers do in fact rest from their labors. The blessings of heaven are certainly God's gifts of grace purchased by Jesus, but no matter of indifference, apathy, or disobedience will be ignored. So for us today, the question is more where do we stand in regard to God's rest? Are we confident we will enter in, or are we uncertain? Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. Come, repent of self-confidence, depend on him alone, live in daily trust and devotion. Augustine said, thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Can you identify with that? Your heart is restless. Even on a daily basis, we have, we have anxious hearts. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. I'm making preparations now to return to South Carolina for my 50th high school reunion. Some of you will get to that point one day, and I hope you'll try to attend. 
Uh, I have not been back to anything at my high school since I graduated. 50 years. And as I've been wondering about this, I've been thinking, I wonder how people will have changed. I haven't changed any, but I'd wonder how other people will have changed in those 50 years. Will the people that I knew in high school who were devoted to Christ, will they still be devoted to Christ? Or will I at my reunion be surprised that some have maybe not remained devoted to Christ? Will they be living as Matthew 25 describes, prepared and watchful for the bridegroom's arrival, active and faithful in the stewardship of gifts, caring and merciful to the least of these, my brothers. But most of all, will they be resting, resting in Christ alone? I'll let you know what I find when I go back. There's a wonderful hymn that I hope some of you know. Um, Maybe we'll sing it sometime. Uh, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee as thy beauty fills my soul. For by thy transforming power thou hast made me whole. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Ever lift thy face upon me as I work and wait for thee. Resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus, earth's dark shadows flee. Brightness of my Father's glory, sunshine of my Father's face, keep me ever trusting, resting. Fill me with thy grace. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Those are great words. And now you know the story of the rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to reflect upon your word. What a challenge the writer of Hebrews gives us in resting in Christ alone so that we will enter that Sabbath rest for eternity. Thank you for the rest we have now. It's not perfect. There is still a lot of concern and anxiety in our hearts, and yet... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through prayer, we can make our petitions known to you, and you will give us a peace that passes understanding. So we do taste a degree of rest and peace on this side. Then we will know fully, and know fully the peace of God on the other side when we enter your rest. Keep our hearts fixed upon Jesus, and keep our lives devoted to him. And may we know your rest and peace today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I also think that next week on Thursday, there is a bus tour of a local Memphis church. And I think I am uh, supposed to be involved with that. So I think... Uh, we will not have this class next Thursday because I will be somewhere riding a bus or something like that. So just keep your eyes open, and uh, if we don't have class next week, two weeks from today, we will. But we will have the men's group on Tuesday. Lots going on. You people like to stay busy. We like to keep you busy to keep you out of trouble.
you like real light. Yeah. So, we'll just do like the first line or two. Yep. So they don't Not together. Well, it sounds She's, fine in here, but we need to go listen to a love it. Stream, the, honey. Okay. Do I need to hit our notes on the piano? Let me just hit them on the piano. Hey, Cassandra. I don't. <laughs> we're in, we're in here all by ourselves. I'm not a bit worried about Ronnie. All right, that's your note. Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay. It's on in the activity room, I think. Let's just go ahead and keep singing. 